This is Chiezan, the prior at Sokokoji Buddhist Monastery. Sokozan offers these talks without expecting anything in return. If you value these talks and would like them to continue, please visit our donate page at www.sokokoji.org. Thank you. Good evening, good after afternoon, good morning, and other times of the day. Where you might be located. The title of the talk today is Fixing the Cover-Up. I'll elaborate on that in a few moments, but it's, a, it's not incorrect. Sometimes situationally, that's the only thing you can do is fix a flat tire. Uh, quite often, fixing works in the area of you know, relative truth, the flat tire, Things that are obviously off filter, off balance, need to be corrected or fixed and so on. But fixing in uh, your emotional, psychological space, uh, we might be so interested in, in getting in there and stopping that or changing it or uh, softening it, it up, we might begin to act on it before we even know fundamentally what is going on there. <clears throat> we need to know fundamentally what is going on. Fundamentally, not just, well, that's broke, I'll fix it. Or this is, this was moved over this way, I'll move it back in the position it needs to be in. Very relative things. Your mind stream is not like that. I'll slide that window shut so I don't want the comments of the, of the bow wow. Probably might make more sense than I'm making if you can understand Bao ease. Speaking of that, help us out here. I'm going to say that very simply, very directly. If you can, help us out. Go to the donate page and help us. Straightforward ask is what that is. I can't think of it, say it any more clearly. I'm not feeling too well right now. So if I, my energy seems low, it is. That being said, I'm not going to fix it. So the way fixing is a cover up is if we try to go into some direction to stop our anxiety or uh, cover up, there it is, cover up, or do away with our fear or explain it away or do something like that. Quite often, maybe not always, but quite often we get tangled up in that in such a way that the, the demand or the requirement or the desire to fix that overrides the actual uh, what needs to happen in terms of seeing what it actually is what is actually happening there and that what is actually happening there if it say if it's in terms of um, say if it is in terms of your emotional state or anxiety there, there are ways to officially cover that up uh, with medications, and, and it may do that. It may give you some relief for, for a time, and I'm not against that. Maybe that's, that's what you need to do. But you could also, if you're a meditator, you could also work with your mind stream by way of observing that, looking at what is showing up, looking at the difficulty, looking at the anxiety, looking at the surface of the anxiety. Don't go down into it, because that going down into it that you think you're doing is actually trying to figure it out and trying to figure it out leads right away from the anxiety right into that uh that uh contraption we call the thinking process and it is looking for results it's looking for causes and conditions in a relative situation and uh the, the labyrinth of the unconscious if i were to use the western term or the labyrinth of the uh, 
Aliyah Vijnana or Vijnana, which is the storehouse consciousness, is untraceable. You can't, you can't even get into it. You can't go into that. You know, it's, a, it's a big joke in the Aliyah Vijnana depth psychology. <laughs> Why? Because it's not relative depth. But the thinking mind approaches everything as if it's just like tree bark. The tree bark's on the outside. Uh, what's that called? The, the Cambrian layer or something like that. Then the next one, and then uh, you go 50 years in, and you know, and then there's certain things happen. It's not a very good uh, metaphor, but it's like, uh, the mind is not like that. It doesn't. It, doesn't, it is not set up in such a way that you can treat it like a internal combustion engine. You can just figure out what's wrong. Is it, is it fuel or is it spark or what is it? Well, these days we don't even talk about it that way. So where was I? Oh yeah, go to the donate page. I mean it, help us if you can. If you can't, then don't worry about it. Come here anyway. But if you can, help. And at some point when I'm feeling a little better, I will say more about that. What we're doing in the terms of that vision, but it's very important. Please give me some questions here so I can just respond to that. Cover ups, cover ups, fixing. Go ahead. Sure, Bang. A minute ago, you said uh, you used the term relative depth. Yes. Is there a fundamental depth? There's an ultimate depth, which is no depth. Ultimate depth is, is this. You can't go deeper. If you go deeper, then we're right into relative truth, we're right into fixing, covering it up and everything. You can understand this conceptually a little ways, but it, it takes work to, to put the conceptual thinking process in its place, which is what? In relative truth. It's fine in relative truth. But your consciousness is, uh, its fundamental nature is ultimate. And the fundamental nature of this piece of wood is a relative up to a point. It's, it's difficult to see the ultimate in this. Uh, you won't see the ultimate in this, in this piece of wood, until you see the ultimate nature in yourself. And when you do that, then everything is ultimate. Everything, this is ultimate, that's ultimate, that's ultimate, that's ultimate. Everything is ultimate. You can't find anything but this. There's no else. It's a traditional teaching, not something I'm inventing to say that it is empty of otherness. It's empty of other. That apparent otherness that shows up in our mind stream so easily is unreal. It's relatively other, but it's ultimately not separate from anything anywhere. It's already depth. Go ahead. Is there another attitude that can help us look at what's in front of us that doesn't involve depth or shallowness? This is what the wall is. A wall is a surface. Look at it. Observe it. See it. Cracks, maybe no cracks, maybe a little irregularity. Maybe there's not much differentiation there at all. Maybe it's very smooth. Like the yoga studio has, has walls that if you look at them, not much is happening there. Makes you want to do some graffiti on there or something. And the mind is like graffiti. It's always coming up with some damn thing. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> That fixing seems to be like an energy that we have to wear out. We have to just continually watch ourselves. Very good. Yes. Observe, watch what's happening. And you and everyone here, if we're to sit down and go to a to go to a, a how much fixing you're doing seminar and all compare notes, we would all have something to say about that and it would all operate in different ways. Some of it, some of it would be tied into the conditioning you had growing up. And you might not be uh, um, 
predisposed to that kind of thing that you've been, but it's been shoved on you so much that you tend to do it. Whereas other people have not necessarily been trained in that, but their predisposition to, to work with things in the way, in that way is to figure it out, figure it out, figure it out, push this down, fluff that up, move this over, stop looking at that. So, and that's just two of that's just this direction and that direction. It's all over. It's all over the place. Go ahead. Is fixing about control. Sorry. Yes, wanting to control. And awareness practices wanting to or endeavoring to see what it is, just see what it is fundamentally. What what is this? What what is this? What is the mind? What is consciousness? Yes, go ahead. Divine. So when we're watching what moves and we see you know, all these comments about wanting to fix it or wanting to stop it or wanting to change what's what's showing up. Just just observing that wears it out, wears out that energy or so if I if I do it this way, this is what's arising and you're just observing it. This is what's arising and you're just observing it. But conventionally what happens in the mind is this is what's a this is what's arising dependently arisen. It has a it has a right to be there. It's dependently arisen. The leaf comes out on the end of a limb and has a right to be there. It's part of the whole situation. What's arising has a right to be there. You can't really see the limb of that particular leaf, but it's there. Otherwise, this will not show up. And this is showing up in your mind stream, and that aspect of the consciousness that is that is uh, uh, with the whole body mind complex uh, has an has an area of it that that is tied in with the body and probably with a vagus nerve that needs to protect something. So if this thing that is arising, this particular leaf, which is none of your business, but it's completely your responsibility to feel, then we jump to the conclusion that that might not be good or that's not mine or that shouldn't be happening. And then the ego mind, the self-centered mind goes for it. She tries to cover it up shut it down, figure it out, blame somebody else for it. Who's causing this to happen in me? I sometimes say, I used to say years ago, nobody's pouring a bucket of feelings in you. Those are your feelings, they're your responsibility. When I say responsibility, just receive those. You can do that. It's like living in a house. It's like, if you realize what this is, it's like uh, the image that I've sometimes used. It's you're in a house and all the windows and doors have been removed. And all and anything, everything is welcome to come and go. And if it comes in that house, it cannot find an occupant because there's no solid identity there. There's just consciousness and the consciousness is completely on receive, receive, receive. The most profound form of generosity is to receive the gift of whatever this is. Yeah. Um, it seems like the, the fixing can um, stabilize into like a maintenance where we don't even see the fixing anymore. Can we, um, if something is solidified like that, can we drop down into the, the production of the, the way that we built that up? Probably not. It's pretty snazzy though. You want to paraphrase that? Go ahead. Bowing. Time's up. No, go ahead. I've lost now. No, you haven't. Go ahead. Time's up. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, you teach us to watch what moves, but when we have a something that's so solid, we don't see the contrast. If we don't see that. Um, move? How, how do we begin to look at that? I, I think, uh, I feel, uh, my understanding is that it's just persistent. You're already, the way you talk, the way your question shows up, you're already aware of, the, of these uh, uh, appearances and these structures and so on in the mind. These are trying to repair, trying to fix, or excuse me, try, or buying into some kind of relative way of of working with it. And so it's just a matter of seeing that 
And over time, you eventually see the fertility of futility of doing anything with it that has to just be received. There, there, and there's still going to be some uh, ego, some self-centered quality that is getting some kind of credit for receiving or being that. I'm just going to receive. I'm just going to receive. I just received. I'm not going to fight with anything anymore. Kind of little mini lectures we give ourselves. Those seem to be necessary. Can can that fixing quality that you're pointing to show up as sabotaging ourselves? Yeah, I don't know if, that, if I care for using that word too much. That that it's too easy for ego to get get a big bite out of that one. Stop sabotaging myself. I'm now completely opening. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure, guy. Like um, with Ondo's question about it being about control, I'm wondering if that same controlling um, aspect can show up when we're doing harm to ourselves. Probably, yeah. but I, you know, some of the you, you, you have some circularity going there, so I would probably, but it's more direct than that. It's more direct than this is happening there. Therefore, I have to do this or do have to do that. It's more direct. Doing a lot of thinking about it is what you're doing, and so you might want to be aware of that. Don't fix that either. Continue to think. Don't improve. Kevin. Kevin Bowling, you, you used the image of going into difficulty as a Dharma gate. How do we go into difficulty without going down into it to figure it out? Um, so receive the difficulty rather than go into it. If difficulty uh, shows up, then just just receive it. Just receive the difficulty. But if it starts to back away, don't go back, back and get it to try to work with the difficulty. Just let it, if it's like a dog with no leash, just let it do whatever it needs to do. More about that? Good, a good area to talk about if you have anything more. Kevin Bowing, when I think of persisting, there is kind of an outward image that comes to mind. So in this case, would the persistence be in allegiance to the receiving uh, rather than pursuing? Yes, yeah. the word I've been using lately, uh, uh, and to change words every now and then, but the one I've been emphasizing the last year or two is intent, is to keep it a very clear, when I say keep it, uh, insofar as you can, just intend to see what this is, intend to, intend to receive whatever shows up, the intention is like observing something, you intend to see what it is, and whatever shows up, um, let it be so, let it be what it is, without modifying it so it's more palatable or makes more sense, or do nothing. It's like Suzuki Roshi says in his book title, in his, in his Dharma talk, uh, uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind. It's like always, always at the starting line. Um, the intention is always to go. But you don't actually go anywhere. You just have the intention. Might even be like waiting on the starting line, waiting for the gun. The gun never goes off, but you're always there. The intention is always there. The race never begins because it's not a relative situation. Therefore, but that, but or rather, that intention uh, transcends the any kind of a, a gun going off or, or a human being on a starting line or some kind of a racetrack. It's it's. The intention to see what this is, beginner's mind, and also uh, it's difficult because when the thinking mind starts to come up with ideas and you know and kind of ideas about how this is happening or how you're receiving this or how this is how this is going that way or going. Yesterday it was like this, but today it's so maybe I should. And then we start to come up with different ways of protocols or um, plans to modify when uh, the, the way to practice with it is just to receive it rather, rather than 
abandon it for some idea about it or some structure, some analysis. And it's not, there are pl places where this is done. I think uh, oh, the therapists that are here, when you say that cognitive behavioral therapy is about really trying to, trying to see what all the angles and what happened here and how, and why you're really doing this while that's happening, but you think you're doing that, but that didn't happen because this over here came in another direction. You missed that part because it was facing, and now it's, and so what do you do with that? Now you watch when that happens and then, am I correct? Am I incorrect? Is it a misunderstanding? No, I don't use CBT, but that's my understanding. Well, why not? It's so valuable. <laughs> <laughs> You don't use it either. I use it for just to offer people an um, option as to how to view their um, thinking process. Okay. So it's based on a triangle, thinking, feeling, and action. Hmm. That come from C.G. Young? Uh, I can't remember who the CBT guy was. Darwin? Boyer? Stephen? Where is that the sun? I know there's a Steven in there. So, anyways. Let's work on that. <laughs> <laughs> I can Google it real quick. I use uh, my CBT book to prop up my laptop. <laughs> I was thinking that CBT was something that came with cannabis already wrapped around it or something. <laughs> or some kind of oil or something. Kevin. Kevin Bowie. So, sometimes we have a habitual reaction to difficulty that shows up as an outflow, which we might feel some remorse about. How do we address that feeling of chagrin or worse? Um, How are you doing it now? Kevin Bowen. CBT. <laughs> <laughs> CBD? <laughs> well, CBD. That's the other alternative there. Kevin, I, I just, I'm thinking, you know, you, you in the past said in, in regard to others, you might apologize once. Yes. And leave it at that. I'm wondering if there's some equivalent that you might do for yourselves. Um, I, I, I think the, the, just like the repetition of Shikantaza is valuable, uh, returning to the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha, repetition, repetition, because it is so radical and simple. Uh, whereas uh, the repetition of, of some kind of, I don't know if you're talking about some kind of palliative for oneself. Or, uh, is that am I, is that what you're looking for? Or? Kevin Bowen, well, I've just heard it's hearsay, but in other Dharma communities, like if you, eat the bucket of chicken when you weren't supposed to or smoke the cigarette or shot your mouth off, you would like kind of confess to the community mm -hmm. or, or have some sort of fixing. Um, I'm not saying there isn't something there that we could go into or look at, but um, the, my uh, the structure that I talk about is uh, CCC, isn't that it? Communicate, lots of communication, lots of listening. So I, I don't know. I, don't, I think I think really good communication between anyone. Let, let people know what's happening with you. If there's some structure, some situation that you're embroiled in, let's, let's talk about it or let's offer that somehow. Make a good makes a good community. It's a, a lot better than the gossipy kind of thing that I've run into in past spiritual communities that I've been involved in. Some of the gossip is intense and painful. So I'm not sure, is there more about that or more around that? Can I, well, so if there was some sort of outflow where one felt it was like below one's personal standards, are you saying you might take that feeling of like regret or remorse to the cushion as a as an inspiration or to return? Um, yes. Or you can go to the donate page. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, take it to the Christian. Go to the Christian uh, of all the places you can go. Uh, sitting down, holding still. If you just uh, reflect on it for a moment, sit down, hold very still without being rigid. You can see more clearly what is, it might be more uncomfortable, but you can see more clearly the way the mind is keep continuing to turn into a knot of security. And that's temporary security. It might feel secure to think about that, think about that and turn into what you're gonna say and what if they said that, if they did that, well, shouldn't I be saying this? Can I just let them get away with that? That's not gonna be helpful to them. Yeah, like we're thinking about them. You wanna be helpful, so let's tell them off when they do that or let's stop them in their tracks or no, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. It's not that there isn't some value there. Again, coming back to relative situations, there might be a time when that shows up and that is something you need to take that person aside and say, look, this uh, what you've said there, what you've been doing is not workable for any of us. It's not helpful. So it might be a feeling of fixing things, but it might be more about just having some very straightforward conversation with just like you would with your spouse or your partner or anyone, or even your meditation teacher. I've often said, bring it to me. If you have any issues, don't, don't gossip about it. If you have a problem with me, I don't care what it is. I mean, let's talk about it. Tell me about it. So and I'll, I'll do my best to work with you where that's at. I don't certainly don't know everything. I need help. We all need to communicate, cooperate, collaborate. And that way, this whole ship, whatever we have here, will float for a while. Nothing lasts forever. A question from Shiva. Shiva. What if the raw emotion is not a cover-up? So since I don't know you really well, if at all, I have to respond to that in just a general way. I, uh, but specifically, if, uh, if some, anyone here asking me that question, you might not get this answer. But the way I'm going to respond to your uh, uh, question is uh, very simple. Again, it could be different if I knew what, where, your, where your question was coming from, how fancy you're being with your mind stream. Fancy by me adding things, collecting this and that and this and that. Just feel it, especially if you're sitting on a cushion facing a wall and you're having raw feelings arise. Just feel the, just feel, feel the feelings. Be responsible for the feelings. Don't abandon the raw feeling for what caused it. Even though obviously somebody uh, three cushions away or three miles away or three minutes away said something that triggered something in your mind stream that caused you to go, oh, or have intense feelings. They did not do it to you. Those are your feelings. When I say your, yours, I don't mean your ego. I mean this whole matrix we call a human being. Uh, that, that shows up because the store consciousness, and here again, I'm going to just say it in a storybook form. I don't know how this works. I'm just saying we just use these, these structures, these forms to help us access ways of understanding uh, the consciousness, which is something that's just impossible to track down. Uh, you know, even Sigmund Freud didn't do so good a job of that. So he got everything rolling. So whatever shows up in your mind, even though someone did it or trigger it, uh, in, insofar as you're able with well, that raw emotion, uh, just feel it. It's yours. It's yours. Be kind to yourself. Don't necessarily abandon what's arising in the mind stream for anything about it, unless, unless you have to, unless it forces its way in. Not easy. And then watch the way that when you're being fully responsible for that, in other words, not no passion against it, no aggression against it, no shutting down against it, passion, aggression, and ignorance, but just receiving that feeling, just feeling that, whatever it is, feeling that. Notice if the, the self-centered mind, the me-feeling part of the mind aspect, the paranoid part of the consciousness is trying to get its two cents worth in there, trying to jump in and say, well, you wouldn't be feeling this if 
if they hadn't, if, they, if you'd start to do this and stop doing that, well, it's your own damn fault, or you haven't done anything wrong here, and yet this person is being treating you this way, and that's why you feel so bad. I mean, you can you go on and on and on and on, but to come back to your question, do I pronounce it Shiva or Shiva? Or Shiva. I would say just feel it. Of all the things that I'm saying, the most important thing is just feel, just feel, feel it right to the center of the earth. That will give you a good image. Watch the feeling and see how deep it goes. And of course, as I said earlier, the only true depth is surface. Go ahead. Shiva has a follow up. May I add on gossip? Would you still say feel it? That, that the quality of that situation is so elaborate and it can be extremely painful. So I r resonate with what you're talking about. But yes, insofar as you can, I would say just feel that. And it depends if you're in a community, especially if you're in a spiritual community like this, take it to the cushion with that person. If there's if you see a person gossiping and you have a you have a structure, a community structure of Sangha, uh, which is uh, which actually is a sangha, not just a community of people gossiping about each other, or judging each other, evaluating each other, or trying to get ahead of the other person to be the best teacher, the best student, or the best anything. So you could actually take that person aside, sit down in front of them, bow to them, and say, "I've heard that you're saying this and this and about me uh, in the community, and I would like you to say that to me, and let's talk about that a little bit." You can actually give the person the benefit of the doubt and give them a chance to say something that they uh, might not expect that, might not expect that kind of openness, but that wouldn't be so bad. And whatever occurs, even if they say, oh, I don't want to talk about that, I can't talk about that. Still, you've tried to work with that in a, in, in a relative way, not about fixing it about bringing it up so you can discuss it, so you can include others rather than pushing them, the evil, gossipy people away. Include them. Jordan, a lot of times when we ask questions, we ask for, like how to work with something. I noticed that. Is it different than how do we fix that thing? Well, quite, sometimes it's how to fix it, but I probably can't tell you that. That being said, I might, I might give you some suggestion of how to how to work with something which may seem like fixing, but going into a solitary retreat is not about fixing anything. It's about looking at the e the ego mind, the self centered mind that's always dragging things around, trying to get some, trying to squeeze some kind of happiness out of samsara. Not going to happen if you go into retreat or if you practice uh, long periods of time. Um, doing sitting meditation, shikantaza, it's very difficult to continue uh, deceiving yourself in any way that's uh, going to be over the top destructive. It'll still be there, it might be painful, but you get to look at it very clearly. Go ahead. Anything more? Other questions? Sir? Sure, well, in the intention or the attitude of feeling deeply be a further form of trying to fix how you're feeling or what's arising? Well, it could be. I mean, you could take anything I say or anything anybody says or anything you say to yourself or anything you read and turn it into some kind of fix-it project. Good. But it's, uh, I emphasize this as much as I can. It's about awareness. Uh, even if you are trying to fix something, if you're really aware of the, of the way in which you're uh, buying into some kind of monkey wrench in the mind that you can stop thinking, stop being angry, stop, 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 control things. So if there's a lot of awareness around that, uh, which will happen with Shikantaza, with a lot of sitting practice, you may still have the mind stream that's uh, passion, aggression, and ignorance is arising, but the space around those feelings, around those emotions gets, uh, gets more uh, extensive so that you're more aware of the degree to which you are jealous, I'm more aware to the degree to which you are 
uh, are irritated or uh, subject to frustration, anger, impatience. Might not be able to, as we say, fix it, but might, might be able to see it because the a fundamental misunderstanding that creates that kind of a, of a um, that kind of a movement uh, is mistaken identity. That we think that there is a person here. There's a body here. There are hands. There's vocal cords operating. All the various things that we could point out. We could go on it down a list and spend the rest of the hour talking about all the things that are a part of uh, a human being. But there's no solid identity. There's no personhood here. When, when one actually sees that, which is possible for you to see, you realize that consciousness is not connected to anything. It's, it's with this particular being, but not limited to it. It's everywhere. And it's not some fancy idea about you look up in the sky and think you're at one with the cosmos. It's not particularly romantic. It's just the truth. And you see it. You can see this. If, if you see this tomorrow or today or next week, you, you may never come and listen to me again. Or you might. Situational, sir. Show by asking in that same area, but in a different way. Can we step back from that fixing quality without it becoming another form of fixing? Give me an example. Show buying at this ball driving today at, at work. Um, there's a lot of really gnarly thoughts and emotions coming up. Gnarly. Hmm. Give me an example of a gnarly thought. I'm excited, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> what would Shoka call gnarly? <laughs> Let's see. Let me see. <laughs> I don't see her anywhere. Is she here? You know who I'm looking for. <laughs> Go ahead. Show goodbye. Um, it's like the, the, the mental process is spinning so quickly that it's painful. And there's this knee jerk trying to, to fix it in some way. And then there's the attitude of seeing that. And it's, are you, are you driving in your truck and whatever? Are you at work? Yes. Go ahead. Keep, keep going. Uh, so then there arises the, like a, a keyword or a phrase of like feel deeply or let it rip and wondering if that's just a, a further lamination of trying to fix it and trying to get better. It could be, but it still, uh, it still sounds like a process rather than a, uh, a clamping down. It sounds like you're still in the process of it. But just like uh, having that feeling coming up and then noticing that sometimes when that gnarly feeling is so intense that it kind of just takes us over and you know, we're, dry, we're still managing to drive and watch traffic, but we're really involved in that. Uh, you, the way that I talked about, this is not about fixing. This is about including everything else. Everything is green. Everything is red. Uh, the, how, how your body feels, gravity pulling you down into the chairs, into the seat so you can even drive a damn car or truck. And then sounds, colors, movements. And at the same time, not getting rid of or pushing that emotion out or doing anything with it at all. Just include it. It's just one more just one more uh one more piece of the ten thousand things just phenomena arising and falling away and rising and falling away so you're not you're not fixing it you're not pushing it out the door but your you, but your entire consciousness is not consumed on this particular gnarly situation where you have got about three uh, percent of your your awareness is on actually driving you, you, you deliberately feel that receive that and then as you receive that begin to receive everything else it's very much like the eye spot 
Yeah, I spot the awareness spot in, uh, um, in the uh, OTEM, opening the eye mind, uh, that we, I talk about or teach. So you're, you're looking right at that, that, that feeling, that's the eye spot, and then expand around that. So the, so the awareness is in the colors of things, in the sound of things, all the sense fields, how your saliva tastes, how, how much humidity is in the air just by smelling, we all can take a guess at it. Or how your, how your skin feels, the clothing on you. It's, it's, it's instantaneous. It's, it's right there all the time, all the time. Your whole world, don't miss your life. It's, it's not just little tinker toy thoughts about this or that or should be or shouldn't be or who said what or who did what or this. Again, I'm not sure, not clear what your gnarly thought is other than the way you described it, I don't know what the content of that is. We don't really have to worry too much about, about the content. Just include include that, you're looking at it. It's right there. You're, you're kind of being forced to look at it by the intensity of it. Is it making some sense? No, so include. And you can include something that's in, in there, and you can also get into the mind stream and include things that are in the mind stream that are available there daydreams, an image that showed up in a dream three days ago, go to that daydream and notice the quality of the texture and the, the, the imminence of the, the image, but the unreality of it. And watch that uh, also out of the corner of your, your conceptual consciousness eye, however you want to say, it's kind of out of the corner of your consciousness. It's off to one side because you're you're enamored, you're stuck to, you're fixated on perhaps this gnarly thought. Otherwise, you would say, ah, gnarly thought, go away. Or, or you'd fix it. You'd say, oh, gnarly thought bag, where is that? Oh, here it is. Pull the, pull the tie. Don't forget to do that. <laughs> Set it off in the seat. Fixed. <laughs> Done. Done with. So. Does that make some sense? A little bit of sense? It's like you're looking at it, you're stuck on it. It's the eye spot of the consciousness spot of the, the thing that's got you the fixation. And, and opening the eye and mind, we're deliberately fixating on something. It's the same process, just a different consciousness. It's not the thinking process. It's visual, which is very simple, direct, and has obvious uh, uh, structure to it. Look right at this and then move the awareness around. One. Um, using the opening the eye mind and um, feeling deeply, is the, is the feeling deeply in the eye spot? Um, could be. I mean, my, if there's if there's anger, if there's a suffering, and if there's you know some kind of threat or some kind of uh, raw feeling that you're not sure what it is, but it feels threatening or it feels like um, uh, dread or feels, feels like depression or all, all the other things that can come up that we could call gnarly. Uh, could be, but you can look right at it. We're not asking you to look away. We're saying, look right at that. Use that. Use that. You can receive it, receive it. And as you receive it, notice all the things you've been blocking out. Just go to two of the senses. Go to a sense of touch, how this feels, and the sense of seeing how this looks. And actually receive the fundamental appearance, not looking at your steering wheel and thinking steering wheel or being trapped by the concept of a steering wheel. Look at the color of that or feel of the, how that feels. You don't, if you, if you actually are feeling how that feels, you won't even know what it is. It better be at a stoplight though. Yes. So, um, are you saying that feeling deeply can include more than what we were trying to feel deeply? Yeah, very much so, including everything. This shows up more clearly in something like a, the visual exercise of the opening the eye mind. Because uh, if you, you have to do a lot of it, a lot more than a few days. Any questions on uh, Zoom? Got a few people here. Oh, everyone is totally copacetic. Yeah.
Everyone is kind of smiling. Isaac Bowman. Go ahead, Isaac. Um, seems like I observe things pretty rapidly. And I'm wondering if that kind of observing, observing, observing is stopping me from feeling things deeply. Um, no. No, it is not. And I'm not in your mind stream and I'm not sitting next to you holding your hand or chatting with you as you meditate, but I'm just, no, it's not, 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 a, not a problem. So some, something that happens, especially with someone that first starts meditating in the first five or 10 years that you meditate, uh, you may, you, uh, because of the very nature of this kind of mind training, you may, may tend to fall into the, the feeling of this isn't enough. I must be missing something or this is just too, uh, it's too barren or there's not enough happening here kind of thing, which can, eventually can even turn into boredom. But no, you're not. You're doing it exactly. You just continue, continue. Did you do some block sitting today? Is it growing? No, not today. Well, you should have. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. But th that there's nothing to, uh, what, I'm not going to say it. Maybe I should. Nothing to fix there. <laughs> nothing to correct. Just you're, you're doing it. It just, it may not, The some of the feedback you tend to, we, any of us might tend to get, might be, uh, uh, might uh, be disconcerting or maybe disappointing or seem uh, seem like we should get, be getting some kind of feeling that what we're doing is okay or right or correct. But not so. I've uh, told, said this to everyone uh, in so many words. Uh, all you have to do is sit down, hold still. Am I holding still? Yes. Am I endeavoring to see what moves? Looking at a wall? Yes. Sitting symmetrical, a few other things like that. But it's very simple. It's a matter of holding very still without being rigid and not, not maintaining that stillness, being very respectful of your body. You might be able to, you might be someone who can sit, sit very still for 20 minutes, an hour, maybe, maybe longer. Do it if you can. But if you sit for 10 minutes and you get very, very antsy or nervous or anything, adjust, move, move your body, pay attention to your body. You won't probably won't hear this anywhere. Well, you'll probably hear it somewhere, but not, not too much. Most meditation teachers are trying to get you to sit still and maintain it, especially in the Zen tradition. There's no room for uh, any, any softness in that, or at least not too much. I would say be respectful shift. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching this out of experience. I made myself sit, sit still uh, in 1980 at a three month long um, meditation practice session with the, the Vidyatara uh, seminary. And uh, I made myself stay there and, uh, and I hurt myself. I hurt my, my knees bad. And, and actually could not sit cross-legged on a cushion for three years. I had to sit in a chair. And it was just pure stubbornness and pride on my part that I was going to sit there if it killed me. I tend to be rather, rather stubborn. So, and I, but I had a, a woman sitting in front of me who doesn't even use a Zafu. And she's sitting there in a, a full lotus and, and doesn't move for hours. So this is what I have in front of me. So I thought I should at least try to sit still longer. Not a good idea. Further questions? Any further questions? Uh, go ahead. No. Hey, Okabali. Earlier, um, we shut the windows and we heard the dog bark. Yes. And so we fix something. Right now, there's so much bird noise going on right now, but nobody seems bothered by that. By the what? The birds. There's just probably, I don't mm. know, 50 birds out there 
No. Chirp them away. Well, if for 50 dogs, it wouldn't bother me. <laughs> it's one dog. <laughs> so and my he, question is, is there any Wait a minute, I want to say more. Okay. I want to say more. Oh, that's good. Go ahead. Is, the, um, is it more important to give our attention to either of those situations? Very good. It's well said. It's a situation. And there are times when you can include the sounds that are outside the building. And then there are other times when when you can close them off. And it's a situation. So like if you're in here practicing chicken and the, the dog sound, the bird noises and all they're appropriate. That's what's happening. Uh, but if somebody uh, is making a lot of uh, talking a lot outside the window or the neighbors or something, then you could close the window because the, the language tends to pull us uh, away from the sitting uh, situation. You might as well just get up and go to the window and chat with them because you're doing it in your mind if you're listening to what they're saying. So we're trying to train our minds. So we want to make it as still and quiet as possible without going over the top and being too you know, make people sit still and nobody gets to leave until the bell rings. And this is just, just unworkable. And again, this comes from doing this for a long time. I was even doing it in here in the monastery to begin with a little bit. And then we back that off. More? Yeah, Kabali. So uh, if something feels like it, it's more gnarly or grating, um, does that, does that need more attention, Bowing? Again, it's a situation, five people in the Zendo, you're here, you know, if, you, if it's really bothering you, you could, you could probably address that. You could get up and close the window. And is that what you're asking about? Well, Kabali, um, Say it's something more um, thought based, um, and it keeps coming up and bothering us. But there are other thoughts that come up, like a daydream that you know, might suck us into figuring out um, how to have a good time at the beach or something. Um, is there is either of those something to direct our attention towards? Um, so when it's arising in the mind stream, chicken toss. When it's arising in the mind stream, everything is an object of meditation. There's no, there's no right or wrong. Just, just look at it, watch it move, and it'll be different with each person. It won't last, especially it won't last if you don't push on it uh, or judge it or condemn it or add, add a bunch of negativity to the possible negativity that's already there. Don't, don't add anything to it. Don't add, don't subtract, don't divide, don't do anything with it, but receive it. And it may not feel so good. It may feel okay. May may be may feel good. Just receive. And when it's when it's outside in your environment, uh, then then it's situational. Then some things you you know receive it if it's birds, and if, it, and if you don't care for dogs, then you should get earplugs. So you you should rate to relate to it as a situation that is changing all the time. Sometimes motorcycles going by. Oh, you're on the street or they're annoying, but they don't last long. You can just receive that, re receive the annoyance. So as far as the dog barking, when I'm uh, in here to give a Dharma talk, um, I would probably situationally need to back that off so I can actually give the talk. Or does that, does that make some sense to you? Or do you think I should just compete with the dog? Makes sense. Thank you. Competing with the dog? Thank you, sir. It seems like when we talk about ignorance, that it's the way that I often relate to it is that the ignorance is covering up something that's underneath. Can there be ignorance arising that isn't about, that doesn't have that idea of depth that's involved? You're going to have to say more. What do you want to know? Does ignorance mean that there's something underneath the ignorance? Oh, ignorance is the very nature of it is to turn away or shut down on or cover up or do something with it. So 
there's probably going to be something there unless I'm misunderstanding where you're going with that. I'm just coming back to that idea of depth and wondering if there's another way of looking at or working with ignorance that perhaps goes beyond that idea of depth. Perhaps. You already have two concepts going. You got ignorance and then you got depth going. So it's very easy to get in there, figuring, sorting even fixing, having a, a special technique that you're going to introduce to the Sangha that stops people's ignorance. It's like the guy I met in the, on that the Zoom that he's in, where was that fellow from? New Zealand or no, no, Norway, Sweden, but had a, that it could tell, could just tell people how to be enlightened. And he even said, I think 98% of the people he teaches are enlightened. But his technique is so good. Finland. Huh? It's Finland. Yeah. You can look them up. <laughs> <laughs> Further questions? When you're bowing, so the three poisons are, are fixes? Are fixes? Are they attempts at fixing? No, well, they're. they're the ego mind, the self-centered mind, uh, um, is propelled by that, by hope and fear, or hope for something better and fear of something worse. And then passion, aggression, ignorance show up in different ways. They're to ignore, shut things down, just don't look at it, cover it up, don't pay any attention, look away, distract yourself with, with activity. My mother, it would, it would not feel good, so she'd just clean house. The house was spotless. And I presume she was pretty successful. She did it all the time. Covered things up, how she felt. Go ahead. I was just uh, wondering if in, if we see ourselves or, um, trying to fix something, is there a way to intercede on it? Just observe it. Could the observing of it then be an intercession? You mean like interrupting it? Yeah. A little bit, just being aware of something that you're trying to do to modify something else, the, the, the spiritual materialism, shall we call it, in that area of trying to control or stop something or start something or get, get some kind of results. Just watching that tends to, observing that, tends to make that structure fall apart without guarantees, but. Well, it's uh, going to my favorite uh, uh, slogan, uh, uh, change your attitude, relax it as it is. That has worked on occasion, worked. particularly okay. when it's a directive from you that has just basically stopped me in my tracks and, and it's like everything mm -hmm previous of any concern yeah. just dissolves. How often does that happen? Not very often. How often has that worked if you do it for yourself? Just change my attitude. I'm just going to change my attitude and just relax as it is. Or it's not exactly a distracting yourself into it. You're actually looking at the attitude of cover of covering or whatever, maybe anger. Uh, you're looking at that, and you, you, because you've been receiving it really clearly, uh, you, you may be in, shall, shall we call it a position, to actually just change your attitude. So that's a slogan that uh, I don't know if you can just, if that's going to work all the time. A person would have to be, a meditator would have to be endeavoring to train their mind regularly in order for that kind of a slogan of a Tisha Seven Points of Mind Training. You know what slogan that is? So it's pretty quick. So I, you know, I, it, I'm struggling with the word. Does it work? Or the it, yeah. it's like I'm looking for a result. I don't like the way I feel. So I'm. But that's not always the impetus. Yeah. The slogan just sort of arises on its own in some cases. So is that 
a fix? So it, you could think of it like a fix, but it won't. You can't count on it. You can't depend on it. So Can you depend on anything? No. It's just like when I was uh, talking to Ashoka about the gnarly thing that's happening with him as he's driving and saying, just include everything, include that, but then include everything else. You could also say about change your attitude and relax as it is, uh, whatever is happening in that, in that difficult area, you can just start to include all the other sense fields that quite often we don't even know it. We're just totally ignoring everything because we're so fixated on this terrible thing that that we're thinking about or somebody said or some some ass activity in our life is causing this this uh, paranoia to come up that things are not going to work out that however you want to say it so my understanding is the most important thing you can do with anything that's showing up is to receive it and if things start to scatter around include them uh, and if you start to project thoughts onto it, but conclude them, observe them, observe them. Don't, don't fix, change anything. And eventually you will see uh, what your, what your true identity is, who you actually are. And the two simple words I, I say all the time that, uh, that are con as a, uh, concepts, but it, it's the only thing I can think of that will describe in a, in a way that you can communicate what this actually is based on what I'm looking at. And that is not separate. It's an astonishing realization and it's flat out ordinary at the same time. Not to, all the two-ness goes out of everything. Life and death are not two different things. Pain and pleasure are not two different things. It doesn't mean that you're enjoying pain, but you can see the nature of pain or having intense pain. And I have it quite often these days. You can see that it's it's just an intense quality that arises uh, in the in the sensorium, and it it's painful. And also, you can eat ice cream; and it's pretty pleasurable. But this it's the same structure that's receiving this. There's no personhood there. But you're a living being, and all you're doing is you're you're living proof of the first noble truth of the Buddha: life is suffering. You're no longer trying to get rid of anything. You actually are living your life totally with all of your senses on receive, and you're here for the you're here for the duration of whatever your life is. You're not concerned about when it ends because you know that what it what it actually is it can't end. I mean, it's not as simple going as going from one room to the other, but it's not a bad image for it for living and then dying. Nothing is threatened at all. Sure looks like it though, doesn't it? So uh, maybe we can take a final question, then we can close for the evening. Any questions out there in TV land? So let me see who's out there, who's hiding in the shadows. Uh, let's see. You can't hide behind those names, you know. Actually, you can hide better if I can see your face, because then I, then I project onto who you are, and I, and, I, and then I don't re really receive who's in front of me, and then I buy into my own projection about who you are, and I go to the person whose face I can't see, like Jen Ziegler, or. Young. There's Jen. <laughs> if there's no final question, we can just close. So, you have a question? Jen, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Unio's reference to the slogan reminded me of the Trumpa teaching to cheer up, or you can always just cheer up. Could you say what that is? Uh, that's that's um, uh, I remember when I uh, I also heard him say smile. <laughs> so um, I, I, th I think he was uh, 
he was not going to resonate with everyone, but I was thinking he was saying that it's this, it's this far away. It's this far away. Just uh, cheer up. Just uh, my way of saying it is uh, really, really appreciate what you have. If you need to do it relatively, just you're here, you're alive. You're, you have a sensory apparatus and you're listening to birds, not to be romantic about it, but you're, you're here, you're functioning. You're, in, in our situation, this country is not uh, in bondage yet, at least not in the conventional sense of being run by a dictator and having stormtroopers in the, out on the road. But and that could happen. That may happen. It's, it's such a big, huge um, situation we're dealing with in the world. But here we are. I think he was just being very direct about it. You could just cheer up. He was always quite cheerful. He liked that word too. I think he got he got it from the British. Uh, cheerio. <laughs> okay, I think that will do it. I managed to get through this without uh, getting any sicker. So, thank you for your indulgence.